Well, hello, hello, hello. Um, I'm going to be talking about taxonomic best practices. I thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm not sure why I've got five minutes uh, longer than anybody else. Uh, maybe it's because I'm twice the average age of the other speakers and you expect me to talk really slowly. Sorry, hold on to your seats. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, okay, so um, the talk divided into two main parts, best practices for users. You know, you've identified your specimens. How are you going to actually explain in a way that makes sense to others what you did? Uh, and then people that produce the keys, how can you make your work easier for users to deal with? And then at the end, I'll do an Alex Jones impersonation. Okay, so uh, the first part was prompted by, uh, in part by this. Um, so we surveyed uh, 567 papers to see in entomology published in 2016. And we looked at some things that really should be easy. You know, were things vouchered? How did you perform the identifications? Uh, the third thing, a taxon concept, that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, so I'm gonna have a little bit of a side tr uh, tr trip through uh, taxon concepts. Now, um, the idea of um, criticizing this uh, came in a few years ago, um, and it resulted from some journals requiring people to cite the original description paper of all the species listed in it. Um, so um, Rudolf Meyer criticized this using this example, Drosophila melanogaster, Meigen, 1830 becomes a citation classic every year because of the number of papers published on Drosophila genetics. Um, and this description is terrible. Like there's thousands of flies that fit this description or this diagnosis, this taxon concept. So it's not useful. Furthermore, it was wrong from the very beginning. There were half a dozen other species that Mygen described in the same paper that we now understand to be Drosophila melanogaster. So the taxon concept was wrong from the beginning. Why on earth should we cite it just because we identified something as Drosophila melanogaster? Okay, so we need taxon concepts because for one reason, the meaning of a name changes over time. And I'm gonna give an example from Among the Bees. Uh, this is Holictus legatus, one of the most easily recognized bees in North America for a century or so. If it's got this typical halictine pseudopygidial area, um, and it's got apical hairbands on the metasomal turga, and its head looks triangular in side view, there. Holictus legatus, no problem, until 1996 when it was found that there's another genetically distinct species in the southeastern US, and you can get both of them on the same patch of flowers in the southeastern slopes of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, they're morphologically indistinguishable, um, but genetically distinct. Uh, they're distinct to allozyme loci. None of you are old enough to remember what those are but nuclear DNA sequences and mitochondrial DNA sequences, including the barcode region, are highly diagnostic for these two different species. Then in 2016, we found that Mexican and Central American ones belong to a third cluster. And then more recently and unpublished, we found a fourth one um, just on the Northern side of the Texas Mexican border. Um, we don't yet have any males of these. So the, the, these other three species are indistinguishable even using male genitalia, even using morphometrics on male genitalia. Well, you might have noticed that uh, at least two of those species I just uh, showed you in um, that weren't negators had names. That's because they had been named before. Um, so if we look at the number of species over time that at some point have been called Helictus legatus, we see it started with, say, in 1837. Four years later, Lepiletier described another one. Smith, a few years later, described another. Cockerel, over the course of a while, described another. One, two, three, four, five different species. And Robertson looked at them and said, yeah, they're all the same. And that was a situation for almost 100 years 
until genetic data showed that some of these earlier guys were right in describing additional species. So the taxon concept for Herlectus legatus has changed substantially over time. And indeed, my PhD thesis, which was entitled Geographic Variation in the Social Organization of Herlectus legatus, was completely wrong. It should have been variation among species in the Herlectus legatus uh, species complex, but we didn't discover that until relatively recently. Okay, so you can get an up-to-date taxon concept for the organisms that you're looking at in a recent revision or a key or an identification guide, but these are things that should be cited. I don't know whether this is an appropriate taxon concept for Drosophila melanogaster in this book. I don't particularly care. Okay, so let's get back to the original assessment. Uh, were the specimens vouchered? Um, did it, the authors say how the identifications were made? Um, and did they say what a taxman concept was? Uh, the first result is particularly disappointing because people have been saying you've got to voucher your material for decades and decades. Less than a quarter of the papers vouchered their material. Less than a third said how they identified it and less than 10% provided a tax on the concept. In fact, when we look at all three and all three are required to make the work replicable, somebody can check whether you identify, identified the specimens correctly if they can access your specimens. People can use the same method of identification as you did if you said how you identified them. And then if you say what tax on concept um, you use, people can check whether that has changed since you did the work. One in 50 of the research, research articles published in 2016 did all three. Uh, there's some humorous examples. Research material was identified at the local pet shop. Identification keys were cited, but for organisms from a different continent, identifications were performed by an expert. I know that's like saying st statistics were done by a statistician, all p-values are significant. You haven't been able to get away with treating statistics that way since the 1950s. But taxonomy can be presented in a way that is completely unscientific in research papers and people do not worry about that. Okay. Now let's look at the other side and what are best practices for people producing identification guides, i.e. taxonomists. So how does a beginner identify something in practice? Well, they will use a key. Sometimes they will go from the key to a diagnosis. And if they've got more time than most people have, they'll go from the diagnosis to the description. So let's look at uh, these. And this ad, old adage is worth bearing in mind. Keys are written by people who don't need them for people who can't use them. And it's fairly obvious why that statement is, is commonly um, repeated. Okay, so for best practices for writing an identification key, see Walter and Winterton's 2007 annual review of entomology article. Um, they talked about dichotomous versus matrix keys. Uh, matrix keys are easier to use for a whole bunch of reasons, but they're more difficult to provide um, because you've got to optimally you score all taxa for all characteristics in the matrix. And that's probably one reason why few taxonomists produce matrix-based keys. They also are interactive, and so the user needs access to a computer um, at all times while using it. Um, so let's just look at dichotomous keys. Best practice, try to have more than one structure mentioned in each couplet. You know, if that bit's missing, you can't proceed. Here we see a bee without the antenna. If to get to its identification, you needed uh, characteristics from the antenna, it wouldn't work. It's also missing most of the hind tarsimeres. So if there was a feature associated with the hind tarsal core, you couldn't use the key either. Make it clear with easy language. Scutellum mutic, scutellum laterally mucronate. Hmm. Uh, anybody using a key to identify bees should know what a scutellum is, but to find out what mutic means, you go online and it's 
usually lack, you know, defensive, lacking the usually defensive part, you know, scutellum defensive. Uh, mucronate, no, okay, it's got, why not say spines? Scutellum without spines, scutellum with lateral spines. Well, it's easy. Well, the only reason I knew what a mucro was was because uh, there's a group of apoid wasps where you have to know what it looks like to be able to identify them. And I like wasps. Okay, now the best practice, illustrate the characteristics with the contrasted conditions next to each other and put the illustrations close to the couplet. Here we see a six lobe, a nearly absent lobe, a six distinct acute or obliquely truncate lateral lobe. Figures are on four separate pages. Okay, so let's use this. All right, so couplet 20. Let's look at figures on page 300 and set, oh no, figures 370, 384. Okay, 370, 384. Okay, I've got to contrast those with what? Oh, couplet 20. Okay, let's look at couplet 20 again. There's couplet 20. Now I've got to compare figures. Oh, I've got to go back to 300. Okay, 300. Should have been like this. Male space. There's the male space. Length and width shown with colored lines immediately beneath the couplet. This is easy to use. However, it goes against the previous statement of using multiple parts from the body, because if you've got a headless specimen of Chilicola subgenus ROE disilis, you will not be able to identify it uh, because so many couplets use just one feature the size of the malar space for the identification. Apologies. Okay, another best practice actually use features from the specimen itself. Don't use geographic area or what the flowers it was collected from. You can't tell what flowers the bee was on if it was in a pan trap. And then we have a nasty habit of translocating species from one part of the world to another. So geographically based keys will fail. Uh, even subfamilies have been taken outside their normal range. Hyliaini were absent from Chile until recently. Two species have been introduced there, including this Australian one. Euryglossini were only known in Australasia until somebody took some to South Africa. <sighs> Dichotomous keys best practices, make them fan-shaped as in bottom right, rather than cone-shaped as in top right. The number of steps, average number of steps to get from the first couplet to an identification increases linearly in comb-shaped keys, but very slowly in uh, fan-shaped keys. So here for 16 taxa, Identification in a cone shaped key requires one to 15 steps for an average of eight and a half nearly. Whereas in the key on the right, all identifications require just four steps, a lot easier for the user, a lot more efficient in terms of time. And you can add 16 species to the key on the right and you get to five steps, add 16 species to the key on the left and the number of steps goes up substantially. But there are other considerations to consider, uh, especially for beginners. If you're going out catching bees, starting off, you know, mostly what you're going to get is honeybees and bumblebees. So put them at the beginning of a key so you can get rid of them easily. And then have full habitus images for all taxa to the extent that that's possible. Okay, so let's look at the keys to the bee genera in North America. Um, it's full of usuallys, and usually isn't very, isn't a useful term in a key because you don't know what's usual most of the time. You know, people that write keys know what know what's usual. Okay, threaded couplet twenty six, marginal cell pointed, apex rounded. That's easy enough. But you know, nomiines, kilostoma, and some serotina and some holectids and exomal opsines and EPO lines and others are different. So you've got to look at other characteristics. And it's either, it's usually this, usually that, 
usually commonly, rarely, usually, usually. Not very useful. Okay, change tag now. Um, and here I'm looking at uh, new genera described in 248 research papers over an 18 month period describing 357 new genera. Why did I do this? Well, um, I looked at some recent new taxa descriptions in bees and found that the quality of the information provided was incredibly variable, even by the same author. Now, I looked at genera uh, of all insects because I didn't want to offend all my melitological colleagues because I'd like to have some friends in the community and I didn't want to alienate everybody. Okay, so let's see whether these new genus descriptions were any good. Was there a key? Was it illustrated? Was the diagnosis useful? Okay, so was there a key? Sometimes. But for over half of the new genera, there wasn't a key provided to enable the user to actually identify. Was it illustrated? In almost half of them, there wasn't a single illustration cited in the key. Only a fifth of them cited at least one figure for each half of each couplet. And so overall, only seven and a half percent of the 357 new genera could be easily identified through use of an illustrated key. So in most cases, uh, the user thinking they might have this organism has to go to the diagnosis. So this is the kind of thing that made me want to look at this in the first place. A typical diagnosis. There are 70 genera in the family, and this one can be sold from that one by this. It's most similar to this one. Okay, so you've got a specimen, you think it might be the new genus, and you've only got 69 of the 70 genera in your synoptic collection. I don't have that one, so I can't tell whether this one is similar, most similar to it, despite having an almost complete generic level synoptic collection. Oh my. Another type of diagnosis is this. It can be told from all others because it's usually like this, it's generally like that, and it's often like this. Now, this seems like a caricature, but there were examples that were almost identical to this. Uh, you have to hope that the thing you're trying to identify is a male. Um, okay, so, 11% of the 357 genera didn't have a diagnosis. Some of them had a diagnosis section that wasn't actually a diagnosis, and others had a section that was diagnosis and something else, all mixed up. So 18% of the new genera didn't have a clear diagnosis to help somebody identify. Those diagnoses were broken up into these four categories. Lists, that was the most common um, form, Subheading diagnosis, then a list of characteristics. Now, how useful is that? Does it have to have all of those? Comparisons amongst the most similar ones. That was the second most common type of diagnosis. Combinations, and then a few of them actually had apomorphies. And there's a modern approach to coming up with the new generic description. So the average number of features you have to look at in a list diagnosis for a new genus published over those 18 month period, 19. So you have to check off 19 characteristics. What if the first five are mouth parts and you haven't dissected them? Oops. What if 10 to nine are all male genitalia and you've got a female? A list doesn't tell you which things are actually essential. Combinations generally do, but on average, you had to check off 11 features. Uh, the maximum number was 90 for a list and 29 for a combination. That's a day's work or an hour's work, if you're experienced, to be able to come to uh, a decision as to whether it's this or that. Were these diagnostic features illustrated? Usually not over 60% of the diagnoses didn't cite a single figure. Less than 20% of them cited all of the diagnostic features as being figured in the paper. So 
diagnoses are written by people who don't need them for people who can't use them. A couple of examples, it can be differentiated because it's more variable. Well, that's useful. I've got a specimen of this. Is it more variable? Well, I don't know. Maybe this thing that looks like it, but is different is different. Maybe it's the same because it's variable. Uh, with some experience, you should be able to tell X from Y. Okay, well, I'd like to be able to tell X from Y. Will you please send me specimens of X and Y? I, my guess is that request will usually go unanswered. Okay, so to summarize, almost no papers that use taxonomy do not abuse taxonomy and thereby taxonomists, but most products of taxonomic uh, work are unnecessarily difficult to use. Most new tax are at the generic level and pretty difficult even for well-trained entomologists to be able to identify. So it's not so surprising if taxonomic work is so difficult to understand that most people don't want to cite it. Recommendations, provide fully illustrated keys have diagnoses that really give the user a confidence that they've made the right decision. It's a member of this ta higher taxonomic group because it's got this characteristic. See, here's a picture. This is what the alternative will look like. It can be differentiated from all other members of this group based upon this and this, see? Illustrate everything. Right now for something completely different. Language neutral set of images. I'm sure I'm not the first person to suggest this. Concave glossa, flooded. Concave glossa plus a U or V shaped epistomal lobe plus banded metasoma plus undifferentiated maxillary palpomeres. Geodesilis, four observations to the genus. It helps if you put in figures of the alternatives. So it's either got all of those characteristics and or the alternatives, L-shaped or obtuse, epistomal lobe, no color bands, and or differentiated palpomeres. And once you've got that, you can go straight to species diagrammatically or photographically, um, relatively easy. Three of the six species in the genus I've got the same length mailer space, so you need another set of images to differentiate those. Anybody can use this, whether they speak English or not. Okay, conclusions. All biologists should become familiar with taxonomic procedures. Just as you should understand the statistics that you do. Taxonomists should make keys much more user-friendly and people that, using them, that use them should cite them appropriately. Thank you for listening. The end.